Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. You are listening to episode 253 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Thank you so much for tuning in to our episode today. If you are a new listener or if you're someone that hasn't taken our quiz yet and you want to improve your sex life you feel you're not meeting your sexual potentials but you know where to start this quiz is a perfect place it takes about five minutes for you to complete it and it will give you some resources about what are some of the areas of your sex life that you can focus on to see results completely free it's my gift for you and This is one of the more popular free stuff that we have on our website. You can find the link in the show notes. Today, our guest is Dr. Lindsay Brooks. We're going to talk about women's sexuality. We're going to talk about what are some of the most important things that we both wish women knew about sex. Because growing up as a woman, you get bombarded with conflicting messages around sex and sexuality. And some of these messages remain with us even to our adulthood. So we're going to talk about some of those messages. Also, we're going to talk about what if you are in a relationship that there is a discrepancy in libido and desire? What if you or your partner want different frequency of sex? What to do and what are some of the things that you can do to close the gap and make sure you are creating a plan that will work for both of you guys. As I mentioned, our guest is Dr. Lindsay Brooks. She's a sex therapist turned sex educator. She has her PhD in counseling psychology, is a certified sex therapist, and has been providing therapy since 2005. She is thrilled to now be bringing her knowledge beyond the therapy room with Sexual Empowerment School, where she teaches women how to build their sexual knowledge, develop pleasure, positive mindset, and learn sexual communication skills through her online workshops and resources. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Lindsay Brooks. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I'm excited and honored to have Dr. Lindsay Brooks on our show. Lindsay, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. I'm very excited about this conversation. You know, what's interesting, as I was reading your background, most people start from a sex educator and they Mm. become a sex therapist, but it seems like you chose a different path. Tell me more about that journey. Yeah, totally. Well, back when I was picking a career in college, I had no idea that a sex educator was a job. I wish (laughs) I had known about that at the time. I probably would have been really interested in that. But what I've discovered is, you know, I started as a general therapist and really enjoyed that work and then really found working in the sexuality niche really excited me and I really enjoyed that work. And as I've gotten deeper into it, I've discovered, you know, so many people just need more basic sex education. Like if they just knew some really fundamental information, it could really change their sex lives and their relationship with sex. So I found that I wanted to make sure that information was accessible beyond just one-on-one therapy because not everyone needs therapy per se. And, you know, the expense and finding a therapist, I mean, that's a really hard process for a lot of people to navigate. So I'm excited to, you know, share this information, you know, more broadly into a wider audience. And so that's why I'm excited to explore kind of sharing it in an online way so it can reach more people. That's awesome. What I found when I was doing the podcast, you know, it's like people when they can listen or watch things in privacy of their home, when it comes to topics that are connected with sex and sexuality, they're more Mm -hmm. willing to do it versus kind of like going to the places or working with someone one-on-one. I'm at awe of courage of people who are coming in to see people like clinicians, therapists, sex educators in person. But I think when you're doing something like online or doing a kind of audio online, like podcasting, blogging, all of those things, I think it's Mm. especially very useful for topics like sexual health. Mm. And going back to your point, you brought up such an excellent 
point, it's been my experience that no, in no other area that basic mm. psych, and I'm saying basic, but it's like really not basic because mm. the information wasn't presented to many people, but like basic right. information can transform people's life. So my other specialty that some of uh, our listeners know about that I work with mm. clients who are struggling with eating disorders uh. and with eating disorders, like information can be useful but only having the information cannot cure someone. But you're right, sometimes mm. when we're struggling with sexual health challenges, having some kind of an online resource or getting the right information can be very powerful. So right. I, I, I think that's wonderful that you, you're you offering that. So I want to more know more about your work with women. So mm. I know when we were kind of communicating, you were talking about that there are things that you want, you wish women knew more when it comes mm-hmm. to sex yeah what are some of those yeah absolutely yeah I found in my work especially with you know women identified folks vulva havers that I think there's an even bigger gap in education about sex in general and their bodies and so just learning more about some of those those things can really be transformative so you know I found kind of like three things I really try to emphasize is First is that you do have a right to pleasure. And that sounds really simple, but I find with many women, when we actually dig into it, they they don't have that belief. You know, they've been socialized that I'm supposed to be there and supportive all the time for other people. When it comes to sex, it's all about my partner and almost like a performance for them and really understanding, oh no, you actually also deserve pleasure <laughs> and your body can experience pleasure and that should be a part of it. So really help, helping women know that and believe that deeply can be a really big transformation. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I'm so excited about this one before jumping to the second yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted sure. to talk about that you know what's interesting is that people on surface say yeah everyone deserves to have pleasure but you're right for many women I've noticed the ambivalence about pleasure mm-hmm. they're struggling to lean into it because yeah. of number of different reasons one is the image that they got as you said like going to the pack to the performative piece of it that mm-hmm. that brand does not resonate with them like they feel like I cannot see myself mm-hmm. in what's portrayed as traditional sexy that's Mm -hmm. not my brand and that's not who I am and Mm -hmm. I often talk to people about finding your own brand of sexuality sexuality Mm -hmm. is about how you feel not necessarily how you look so I think that can cause an issue and one other interesting oh thank you (laughs) one other interesting piece that is that people have certain image of individuals who are sexual like I have Mm. clients that are brilliant smart successful and they say they have in the back of their mind that smart women intelligent people they're Mm. not sexual like you Um, you might be mm -hmm. if you're sexual maybe you're shallow like think of that Mm. nature and I think it's really important to uncover what gets in the way so I I love that so please tell us the second one totally yeah and those are some great added layers that you just shared Let's see, the other piece I think that that can be really useful is giving women permission to explore their bodies and actually identify what they enjoy and what gives them pleasure. And like figuring that out on your own first, I find being so helpful before even trying to introduce that to a partner. Like, how are you supposed to communicate about what you like if you don't yet know what you like and you're kind of just waiting for someone else to show up and and show you. And so, you know, in, in my work with a lot of female identified clients, vulva havers, I found that many of them felt either masturbation was wrong, shameful, or like it was for boys, quote unquote, it's not for us. And something that many of them have never explored, or if they have not until much later in life. And so I find that's often a really useful first step is to give yourself that permission, really get to know and explore your body. And then like, wow, what can that unlock for connecting with a partner? Well, I think with that, it comes this limiting belief that I hear many women have that if I'm in a relationship, then it's not okay for me to masturbate. Or Mm -hmm. this is the exact sentence I hear at times that Mm -hmm. I'm a loser if I masturbate. Oh, uh, no. So people, <laughs> people think that their need need to be met through relational sexual experiences mm-hmm. and solo sex is inferior. What do you think about that? What do you have to say about that? Mm, well, I would say it's definitely not inferior. It could even be superior depending on your 
situation. <laughs> and that it can really be used to augment sex. Like it doesn't have to be it's sex or it's masturbation. Like I really encourage a, you know, broadening of the definition of sex and that sex should include a lot of different behaviors with your partner. So masturbation could be we masturbate together or we watch each other masturbate or we're, you know, not quite in the mood to have, you know, intercourse, but we're going to manually stimulate each other, right? So that it can be a part of sex that's really useful and it can just be a part of, you know, owning and understanding your own sexuality and another way of expressing it. There's so much to be learned there and so much joy to be had there. So I would encourage a different <laughs> a different viewpoint on that. Well, I, I'm with you. You know, I was just having this conversation with my girlfriend that she mm. is like, we agree in all aspects except sexuality. And she was mm. sharing with me that, oh God, like I'm, a, I'm a, there's something wrong with me if I cannot meet my needs through a kind of like sexual experience. And mm. she was saying that it's desperate to master it. And I was telling her that's mm. actually different, completely different, because if you are fulfilling your sexual needs, so I tell clients it's like sex with yourself could be mm. like sometimes eight out of 10, nine or out of mm -hmm. or 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. So if you are meeting your needs and you have some awesome experience at worst eight or nine then you you're not gonna lean into the relational experiences that are not satisfying mm. you're mm. saying that if like sex with me is a 80 or 90 percent yeah. awesomeness and the awesome is a minimum <laughs> then right. i'm not gonna <laughs> go with someone that doesn't respect me or doesn't like me or all of that again that's not right. always the case but i, I also very and supportive of the idea of women exploring their bodies mm -hmm. and exploring your body doesn't necessarily mean like you have to masturbate to climax right sure. it could be just like exploring pleasure and sensation so i love that you put it as a as a, one of those second kind of like things that gets in the way of you know, women having the sexual life they want mm -hmm. yeah and then i would say the, the third big thing i see is the oh so common myth that women should orgasm through penetration mm -hmm. and that that is the best and like only way <laughs> women should orgasm and that there's something wrong if you know you're having penetration of sex and you can't have an orgasm and we know that in reality there's actually a, a mi minority of women who can orgasm through penetration alone so just dispelling that myth and saying like it's pretty uncommon actually for that to be the case and most women need clitoral stimulation in addition or clitoral stimulation only to reach an orgasm that is one thing I've shared with so many women that they've been like, oh, that's that's mind blowing. That really releases a lot of shame for me. That helps me communicate with my partner. Like I was feeling like I needed to fake it to like make them feel OK that this was working the, the way that it should and instead can open up. Oh, there's a whole menu of lots of different things we can do. And penetration might be a fun part of that, but that doesn't have to be pressure on that. And there's nothing wrong with you if that is not the way you reach climax. And related to that, you know, what's interesting is that I have this negative reaction when people kind of give orgasm a hierarchy, like mm -hmm. a, a G-spot orgasm better than this, like penet yes. penetration is better than clitoral stimulation. And I know one of the wonderful thing that Lori Min says, like an orgasm is an orgasm, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel if we're saying that, oh, I had an inferior type of orgasm, then mm -hmm. that put the pressure on you to have expectation from your body that might not work for you. So mm -hmm. I I love that you're talking about that there could be a different ways that people experience orgasm some people experience orgasm through exploring other erogenous zones and there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that right absolutely yeah and that if you can open your mind to all different ways then I think that can, has the potential to lead to a lot more pleasure and if we just stick to this rigid sexual script, like, okay, we're supposed to maybe kiss, roll around for a little bit, then go straight to penetration, and that's supposed to meet my needs, it's pretty rare that that's going to meet a woman's sexual needs. So if we take that myth out of it, then all of a sudden, there's a lot more room and flexibility in that script and a lot more ways to discover pleasure. And I, along the side of the same kind of thinking, I always catch many people or when I have conversation with women, I hear that there's this misconception that orgasm is something that someone gives you, mm. right? That it's, it's, a, it's something that you have to have a partner to experience. But I tell people like, it's your internal experience. You're yeah. learning to experience orgasm, you're experiencing orgasm, and you mm -hmm. get to experience it with or without partner. 
Yeah. And I think that's that's something important for people to keep in mind. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> well, tell us, like, you know, one of the myths that I hear that women, like, traditionally would think, like, oh, women don't want sex. And we hear mm. that a lot. And I think that causes lots of issue in relationships because right. the kind of a script that many women have is that sex is for my partner. So they kind of mm-hmm. continuously putting themselves in the situation that sexual experiences are not pleasant or not exciting for them. And right. overall, over time, they lose desire so tell us first of all what counts as a normal libido or desire I, and i'm using mm-hmm. air code and <laughs> sure. is that true that many women they don't like sex gotcha yeah well to answer your first question what's normal quote unquote i would say there is no objective normal and what i would check in with yourself about is like what is normal for me So when I've been kind of most embodied and most comfortable with my sexuality, what did my desire level look like? And if there's been, oh, a drastic change from that, then that's when I would examine like, oh, what's what's going on? There's something to explore here. And so to think about what's normal for you. And then the the belief of like, oh, women don't want sex or women women's desire always fades. You know, you always hear these jokes about like, oh, you get married and then women don't want to have sex, that, those kind of things. And I would say there's like, the answer is like, yes and no. Like, yes, there are many women who struggle with desire, but that's not the majority. And I find that most women who do struggle with it, it's about the context and the pressures they are experiencing. And so I find, I think of it more as actually sex education problem than a desire problem. And that for most women, if they have more sex education, more information, and can actually have the space to explore, like, what are the things that are affecting my desire? then that that can shift pretty easily you know so just for example like we know you know the context that we live in affects us emotionally affects us physically and of course both of those things affect us sexually so things that might kind of like put put the brakes on desire are you know stress levels and how many directions am i being pulled in and oh i have this new health issue that came up and oh, actually my partner and I have been feeling more disconnected lately. So those are just some examples, but figuring out what are those things for you that kind of put more of the brakes on desire. And then you can address them and one by one see, oh, if I can address each of these, then what happens with my desire? Does it then start to resurface again? Such a great way of putting it when you're talking about baseline or kind of quote unquote normal desire, mm. kind of like mm-hmm. looking into when do you, when you don't have those breaks in your life, how much sex mm-hmm. do you want to have? You know, at times I tell my clients that if you're on vacation and there's no mm-hmm. stressor, how frequently you want to have sex? And right. for some people could be once a week or could be once a day or once a month. And there is no mm-hmm. right or wrong answer. And when we're talking about mismatch in couples, mm-hmm. sometimes people People think that, oh, there's something wrong with the per- partner that has a lower desire. But right. all of these are so relative. She or he can be in another relationship and that, that person can be a higher desire. So right, exactly. it's just there is no normal. And I think the point you brought up is an excellent one, kind of identifying what are some of the breaks that gets mm-hmm. in the way of your experience and desire. Many women, as you mentioned earlier, they're feeling ambivalence about pleasure. Like they mm-hmm. never learn to prioritize pressure, pleasure. Mm-hmm. Many, many of us, and I talk about in my show that I grew up in a conservative community. So there's some shame connected to that, paired with mm-hmm. life stressors. All of these can impact our ability to connect with sex and kind of our sexual self. So mm-hmm. I think it's, as you mentioned, it's important to kind of know that what can I do to optimize it? And right. on the other part of it, what I see a lot in my practice, surprisingly, that there are couples that are women that are, are a higher desire partner, mm. and it can be very complicated. And for both of the party, because the script right. that you have in the society is that, oh, men are sex machine. They, they mm. want sex all the time. Mm -hmm. And then some people find themselves and a lot of people in an opposite script. So how how do you help people to navigate those situations? Totally. Yeah. And I I love what you said about like, if you put any two people together, they're going to have different 
drives, right? <laughs> They're going to have different levels of desire. So, you know, just to begin with normalizing that of like one person isn't bad or there's a problem with them, there isn't something wrong. It's like, okay, these are our desire levels. How do we come together? So starting just from that, that framework of like, there's, there's no one wrong in this situation and it's really normal to have different levels of desire. And then I talk about it as kind of a couple's issue in the sense of like every couple has perpetual problems, like things that are perpetually something you have to deal with and work on in your relationship. And so if your you know, desire level is pretty different and there's a larger gap, then that may be a perpetual issue that you have to address and work through. So kind of naming it as that is like, okay, we know this is something we have to continue to work on in our relationship. So just starting off framing it that way, I think can be really useful to keep the communication open and have it not be like, you know, become a me versus you source of tension, but instead, you know, we're on a team together and working through it. And then there's, you know, specific things each partner can do. But any, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Before we <laughs> well, go I think further. that's fantastic. And I was about to, you read my face and I was about to jump into <laughs> asking <laughs> questions I, because I like how you frame it. It's a team effort and it's not a matter of like pointing finger. And what I find really tough, especially in couples that they have good relationships and other parts of their lives is to talk about it, to bring mm-hmm. up the issue. That's so tough. Do you have any tips around that? Mm, on bringing it up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oof, that's that's hard if you don't already have that good foundation. <laughs> so I'm hoping they, they already do and can utilize those skills. But if, if you don't, you know, maybe getting some support with the sex therapist to help you start those conversations. But I find, you know, starting with what is going well, what I'm feeling excited about first, and then sharing what are the things we need to work on can help open the door to the conversation where it's like, these are the things I'm really enjoying and liking. And I'm hoping, can we continue to build and work on our sexual relationship? So pairing the positive with the things we can still address, I I think can help with the communication and decrease defensiveness or fear in, in bringing these things up. I agree with you. And I think it's oftentimes it's useful when we have a plan of action around mm-hmm. things, because sometimes we bring up this difficult conversation and it's we don't have a roadmap. We don't know, okay, where are we go from there? That if mm-hmm. it's a lack of skill, then what are we doing? Or this is mm-hmm. if this is something that's it's a desire issue, what are the solutions? So mm-hmm. I, ta- I encourage people to, if you are bringing up the conversation, maybe to have a couple tools as a suggestion in mm-hmm. mind. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're bringing it up with your partner and the partner has tons of wonderful ideas. And of course, mm-hmm. if it's a shared plan, it's going to be better. But if mm-hmm. there's no action, like follow-up action plan, sometimes after t- after so many of those conversations that can to turn mm-hmm. to this nagging, turn to this nagging cycle that kind of like right. kills more of a desire and a connection. Right, exactly. So let's have an agreed upon game plan we're going to move forward with is really helpful. Do you have more suggestions for couples that are in this situation? Yeah, yeah. So I would say there's like, I think about it as both partners need to do something to help close the gap. So it's like each person has some work that they can do. So the person with the lower desire in the couple, I would encourage them to explore more, you know, what are the things that are, you know, putting the brakes on their desire and what are the things that do accelerate and excite them? And I'm sure you've talked about the book, Come As You Are, the Emily Nagowski book on here. That's a great book. I would recommend has some wonderful exercises to help you really explore more in depth. What are the things that really excite you and get you going? And what are the things that get in the way and how to then create a plan to maximize those things? So it encourage the lower desire person to really start to do that work. And then as they understand themselves better than share it with their partner. And then with the person with higher desire, encouraging them to figure out what are ways they can get sexual satisfaction and release that are more creative than just intercourse with their partner. So some of that solo stuff and some of that is things they could do together. So I would really want to help them develop a solo sex practice that is really fulfilling for them. Not just, you know, I think a lot of people think of masturbation as like, okay, this like thing I should just like get, get over with and, you know, this, this quick release and, and let's just get it done and it's kind of shameful and I should hide it. But instead think about it as like, can you actually think about it as sex with yourself that you could slow down and do more mindfully and have it be an enjoyable, pleasurable experience. So have them 
feel more creative and erotic around their own solo sex. So that feels more satisfying. And then exploring together as a couple, what are alternative things that we could do together? Even if we're not both feeling like having sex at the same time, are there things we could still do if one of us isn't in the mood? So could we cuddle? Could we, one of us masturbates and the other, you know, holds that person or is just with that person, you know, figuring out what could be just added activities that they do together to have that intimacy but not putting pressure on, it's got to be intercourse every time. And that's the only way to feel sexually connected. Such a great suggestion. Speaking of game plan, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that can be someone's game plan. And I like Mm -hmm. that you have tasks kind of like assigned to each partner. So it's not like Mm -hmm. we're not sitting back saying that, oh, the other partner need to fix themselves, again, air Mm -hmm. code, that they're fixing Mm -hmm. themselves and then our sex life can be great. So I think our own sexual health is our own personal responsibility. So I think it's important to kind of think Mm -hmm. about if the desire is lower, how can I kind of like, you know, Esther Perel says like planting seeds in the garden of desire. How can I plant Mm. seeds? How can I remove the barriers? And for the other partner, it's your responsibility to kind of like, as you mentioned, kind of find different things that you find exciting and is within your marriage agreement. Mm. And also kind of like negotiating solo sex, because I know sometimes Mm. people think that if my partner masturbates, then that's considered cheating. Mm. And we're really cornering ourselves that if our desire are not matching we are in a monogamous relationship Mm -hmm. we don't want to have sex with our partner so it doesn't leave that much options for uh, maintaining the erotic energy in the relationship exactly yeah like I I think in general the more like expansive we can be Mm -hmm. the like bigger sexual menu we have for both partners that's usually going to lead to more more pleasure and more satisfaction for both So I I would hope if someone's holding that belief around masturbation, they'd be willing to examine it and explore it a little more. Like, hmm, is this limiting how either of us is achieving pleasure in their life? And also for the lower desire partner, like, does that then also put more pressure on me to maybe have sex when I don't want to? So I wonder the, the trickle down effect of that mindset. Absolutely. And at times I hear from couples, one of the fear is that if they masturbate, maybe they don't want to have sex with me. And that's often is not the case for most people. Actually, you can right. have more connecting, fulfilling experiences if there is not that build up pressure that mm-hmm. like there's that cycle of pressure and rejection and avoidance, all of those vicious cycle that many people unfortunately get stuck with, which is part of sometimes it can be part stage and part of a relationship, but it's important to look into it. Well, I can talking about this, about all of these things with you for hours. (laughs) I know this, we are toward the end of our time. So if our listeners that are listening right now and they want to connect with you, what are some of the places that they can get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So where I'm providing sex education resources is sexualempowermentschool.com. So you can find everything there, but I'll share a couple of resources that your listeners might find interesting, particularly if you're a woman or a vulva haver and you're wanting to explore more what might be getting in the way of your sexual desire and your sexual pleasure. I have a quiz that it's really quick. You know, you answer a few questions and it will give you a response with like here here's maybe the thing that's getting most in your way and then we'll give you a tip and a resource for how to start addressing it so we're talking about the you know low desire partner in particular that could be a a really helpful resource and then also I'm going to be offering a eight-week sex education workshop for women and vulva havers the wait list is open for that and it's probably going to be starting in December so feel free to hop on the wait list if you're interested in getting you know more in depth into this type of sex education that can really lead to big change in your life. Well, thank you so much for sharing those resources with us and being so generous with your time. I will make sure that people have access to your website and thank you again. It was lovely to connect with you. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for your your show. It's a great resource. Thank you. I hope you guys found our conversation meaningful and it gave you some positive thing to help you to kind of look at some of the beliefs that you have around sex and sexuality 
whenever I have this type of conversation about upbringing and impacts of the childhood and our sexuality, it always almost trigger some of my early childhood memories. I know a few years ago, I talked about the one of the first book I read on sexuality. It was Italian erotica that was translated in Farsi. And the plot of it was a young woman and a man who who were in love they had sex and i think the book was written in 40s they didn't have premarital sex and during sex the woman showed her enthusiasm for sex and that was a huge turn off for for the man and that impact the course of their relationship i cannot even believe that that was part of the <laughs> narrative as i'm sharing this with you guys anyhow and that kind of instilled this fear in me that if a man sees enthusiasm in me for sex they might reject me and obviously that wasn't the case and I'm a woman that's sexually eager I think sex is important but at times when I show my enthusiasm that narrative that voice shows up for me and I kind of like almost whispers that are you sure you want to do this the reason I'm sharing this with you to say that unlearning some of these messaging is a this is my life work I talk about sexual health with women I promote sexual liberation But still, there's a part of me at times that shouts this messaging to me. I just learned to ignore it. Anyhow, I hope that you guys continue to work on separating yourselves from these negative narratives. And as you guys know, I announced it last week. I'm thinking about pivoting the podcast content to exactly what you want. I developed this brief survey. I think it takes about two minutes max. It has less than five questions and it asks you about what kind of a content you're interested to learn more about. If you have a few minutes completed, because I'm going to focus my content production around those topics. And as a way to say thank you to you, I will enter your name if you want to win a giveaway of Amazon gift card. Please, please make sure you are answering the quiz and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.